Most people before their first cup of coffee in the morning, they've used space. It's ubiquitous, but it's invisible. So most people don't realize it. Briefly define, as you see it, the mission of the Space Force. When you say space, we think uh, you know, fighting in space, uh, Luke Skywalker and all that kind of thing. It's not uh, astronauts fighting in space, but uh, weapons can be introduced in space. How do we defend these uh, assets, these satellites we have up there? What is the specific, how would you describe the specific mission of the Space Force and why we need a separate service to make sure this job gets done and not lost in the bureaucratic muck of uh, the Pentagon? <laughs> yeah. I can well, say that, you can't, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, Steve, as you know, the Air and Space Forces are the only two services that have been built since the 1700s. The Army, Navy, and Marines, they were all around when Thomas Jefferson was president. They were already in existence. The Air Force was created because technology has moved on, and the Space Force is being created for the very same reason. Air is a domain where aggression can take place, and space, similarly, is a, is a domain upon which we depend and whose defense is essential to our way of life. So we, the, the mission of the Space Force is to protect America's national interests and those of our allies, uh, and to make sure that our way of life that is dependent upon space is not intruded by enemy behavior. We are happy for the peaceful use of space to be available to everyone. We don't want to control space to everyone else's detriment. We want to make it accessible to, for the benevolent use by all. But if there is bad action there, we will not be a victim. We will not have America be held hostage to uh, malevolent action by others. So that's somewhat evidenced by our GPS system that did not have defenses. We are, were blithely thinking that this was a place where free access and um, availability was a good idea and that others would abide by that. Now we know that we can't count on that. So we need to be able to protect ourselves. Tell us why the Space Force is part of the Air Force. Uh, people always use the analogy of the Marines and the Navy, but some say, gee, the Space Force should have been separate. Why, is it just because that's the way you could get it done? What's the rationale of having them still under the same roof, so to speak, even though they're two separate organizations now? They are, there are great efficiencies that are derived from having the two work cooperatively. The Air Force is providing a lot of the common uh, uh, services that would be very much more expensive if the Space Force were to, try, were to build that for their for themselves. There will be things that they do that they must build for themselves within the Space Force. But so the Space Force is not a uh, labor intensive. It's a smarts intensive. It's a technology intensive. It's a capability well, intensive. Or 40 people with the GPS, I mean. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that entire, when you think about it, it's, that's a great metaphor for what the Space Force does. 40 people, eight or 10 on a shift, sitting in Colorado, run the entire GPS system that is free to the world. And that people in India check, uh, use to check um, their weather patterns and that people around the world use incessantly. Uh, the GPS system is operated by a team of a, a, a crew, a staff of eight to 10 people at a time sitting at computer consoles in, in Colorado. And that, I mean, I would put forward the GPS system as the system that has had a bigger impact in a shorter time on all of mankind than any other invention in mankind's time. I mean, think of fire or the wheel or the printing press. What would compete with the GPS system that has been operational, fully operational just 25 years and is used by so many people around the world with so few people managing it. It's a remarkable uh, reality of our time. We're utterly dependent on uh, peace in space or security in space. And most people don't fully realize it. We use it every day, but we don't fully realize its significance. 
Ah, uh, Steve, you're exactly right. It is a remarkable thing how completely dependent most Americans and people around the world are in our day-to-day -day lives on space. As I've said I, before, I think most people before their first cup of coffee in the morning, they've used space. It's ubiquitous, but it's invisible. So most people don't realize it. I mean, you may waken to an alarm clock that is set to a timer that is airborne, that is spaceborne. It's coming from a satellite. Um, our ATMs, you can't pump gas without uh, using space. Uh, the news probably is derived from a space asset. Uh, our weather predictions are coming from space assets. Crop monitoring, environmental uh, environmental monitoring. Uh, these things are all dependent upon space. Just in summary, our information, our navigation, and our communications are all space dependent. It's ubiquitous, but it's invisible. When we went to the moon half a century ago, it was really uh, two actors in space. Now there's scores of countries, literally thousands and thousands of satellites and tens of thousands or more on the drawing board. Um, describe disturbing, some of the disturbing aggressive actions, starting with what China did in 2007 when it blew out deliberately but showed the world they could do it, one of their own satellites, and a couple of things the Russians have been doing uh, in the past years. Walk us through those, why it's uh, not the benign place it was a half a century ago. Well, that's it exactly. In 2007, the Chinese did blow up one of their own satellites, just demonstrating their ability to do it. They created a huge debris field that will create havoc uh, for long into the future uh, in that there are now uh, thousands of pieces of that satellite floating through space or rocketing through space, most of them at 17,000 miles an hour, um, creating a big hazard to anything else that's up there in that pattern. Uh, the, the Russians very recently, earlier this year, uh, have a, a satellite that they launched and it's a very interesting one. You've all you've seen the nesting dolls that uh, are the babushka yes. dolls that are famous in Russia. Uh, well, this satellite could be called the babushka doll in that inside the satellite, it spawned a second satellite, um, just as a nesting doll releases a second nesting doll. That second satellite uh, ended up. Uh, we were able to observe that it was uh, a. Uh, malicious satellite, that it was a weapon. Now this all would have been classified in earlier times, but it's important we're to talk about these because people may not appreciate or understand how very dangerous that environment is. That second Russian satellite came threateningly close to our own satellites the KH uh, in, the same, in a similar orbit. KH-11. Exactly. Uh, and uh, if you'd done that, the equivalent on the seas, where there are established rules, that would have been considered a very hostile act. Have they backed off from that yet? I know we protested. Have they, uh, or are they still close enough to make let us know they are watching us? It's still, uh, it's still a threat. And the challenge is, as you've described, that we don't have rules of the road. It's time for us to establish in that domain of space what are the rules? How close is too close? How do you behave in space? And we've seen the, the Russians with their uh, jet aircraft and with their uh, maritime capabilities coming too close. And they are openly defying the rules of the road, but there are rules of the road. Uh, similarly in space, we need to have those rules so that we know uh, what is a protestable action and that's we're building through the space uh, force and through space doctrine rules of the road that help to identify what is uh, to how close is too close. And uh, I gather in July uh, the Russians uh, fired a projectile into outer space for the first time. Uh, it was Cosmos uh, 2543, another aggressive action. Exactly. The Russians and, uh, are demonstrating their ability to uh, take action that that is very threatening to our assets. Anti to our assets, anti-satellite um, missiles from the Russians let us know that our assets in space are not um, are not invulnerable. 
And it's not just Russia and China. Uh, Iran earlier this year, the Buckley incident, where we avoided casualties, but missiles were fired at us, and we were able to uh, take immediate action. North Korea in March. Uh, China, you going to the dark side of the moon. Uh, and apparently they want a full-time presence on the moon by 2024. Very, very different environment. Space is not optional today. We count on it for our day-to-day -day life, but we also need to be attentive to the importance of space just as it was in the 60s. It was vital for us to be among the leaders in space, to be the leader in space, and America today is the leader in space. But we can see the trajectory of China especially and Russia increasingly uh, that they are looking to uh, plant flags and to uh, develop space capabilities and space resources in ways that have not been the case before. And if they, in effect, control space, somebody said they could uh, turn our intercontinental ballistic missiles into antiques if they have that, uh, in effect, watching down on us and seeing everything that we do and uh, being able to uh, paralyze it if, uh, if a conflict came. So this Throughout. gets to this gets to uh, the new space force. Uh, how 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 is it going? The concept uh, sounds needed. We need it, and so how 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 is it going? Uh, in term, let's start with personnel. You're, you're part of the Joint Chiefs, the the Space Force. Uh, you've got 86 cadets out of the Air Force Academy mm -hmm. uh, joining the Space Force. How do you, how do you build a new service and do so where it's not just throwing some stuff together and saying the new uniform, therefore it is. How are you establishing that essential esprit and sense of a new culture? This is different from the Air Force, different from the Marines. It, it, it's a, really a, a real new organism, so to speak. <laughs> well, as we close in on our first year anniversary on December 20th, uh, there is a lot that has been done from the first day, we started off with 16,000 people that were working for the Space Force, but they were not members of the Space Force. They, they were still wearing the uniform of a previous service, most of them the United States Air Force. Uh, well, over time, we have started to build the Space Force as members. So there's a difference between working for the Space Force and transitioning into taking off the old uniform and putting on a new uniform that would be the Space Force uniform. And that requires swearing in again, being commissioned as an officer again, and, uh, and, and some administrative details. So progress is being made. We are building a bold, agile, and innovative force uh, focus really on capabilities. For the first time, we have a budget. Now, it's the budget that has been uh, reprogrammed or reassigned uh, from other places. Uh, but the, the mission we have is to build greater space capability and protect the space capability that we've had. The budget uh, the number I saw is $15 billion Exactly. The first year, hopefully increasing in the years after. One of the challenges in anything like this is uh, you have some 60-odd agencies that have a, 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 a space piece in their portfolio, uh, including the armed services. You mentioned earlier how uh, the challenge with the Army having to give up uh, the Army Air Force to create this new entity. Uh, just quickly explain why you need a separate entity that can truly focus so it's not just part of a larger organization but truly can uh, devote the intellectual resources, thinking, new think tank, coming up with a special thing, and eventually probably a, a, an academy, since uh, the assets and capabilities for space is different from the other military services. Well, of course, there's a great symbiosis between air and space, and we anticipate that there will still be a cooperative relationship. The Space Force doesn't want to spend their time and effort building um, a chaplaincy, a band, a, an academy, uh, the, the kinds of things where air can work with space, uh, the space forces, especially welcoming of minimizing the overhead and, and using cooperative base management and those kinds of things. At the same time, space forces really focused on enhancing their capabilities. Um, 
as, as you would predict, uh, those 64 other entities that have something to do with space do not readily give up that authority. So it will take time, but over time, the space force is picking up uh, more and more of what has been the space uh, responsibilities of other entities. We work closely with NASA and the NRO and uh, Commerce Department and others, Transportation Department and others that have space interests. But for the military interests, we will hope to, over time at least, concentrate all of that within the Space Force portfolio.